welcome. It's Friday, sunny outside. My finger is probably not going to fall off, so things are things are going well. Birds today are sticking with the theme of birds in trees, but this time birds inside trees as opposed to just on trees. Uh, here we have a, a pair of baby starlings. Uh, they may look uh, cute, but starlings are actually an invasive species in North America that sort of take over the nests of, of native birds. So, so uh, birders, birders are not huge starling fans, but they nevertheless work hard to bring bugs and, and whatnot to the babies. And back and forth and back and forth, more and more food. This particular adult looks a little little bedraggled. Uh, birds don't don't sweat, but it, it does look sweaty. Uh, and then uh, this is a wood a type of woodpecker called a flicker. Uh, woodpeckers, of course, most common birds you'll find in holes in trees. This is an, an adult female. Here is a, a juvenile male. You can see how much how much smaller it is. And finally, a appropriately named white-headed woodpecker. Um, that almost looks like a, could be a telephone pole. I did once in, in Seattle have outside my bedroom window a pileated woodpecker just like hammering away at uh, the wood on a telephone pole for like a full week. It would just wake me up every morning like bam, 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 bam. Um, So it was, it was persistent. All right, what questions do you have about uh, the lab, buffer overflows, anything like that? Eric? Can you review the syntax for using the code Yes, so I will demo how to uh, take assembly code you have written and get the raw bytes that uh, will what you use, so I will demo that. Uh, other questions? <coughs> Oh, I guess I just started on the lab and felt very overwhelmed by it. Do you think you could just like give a free intro while we're doing that? Yes, so let's do that now. So to start off the lab, go to the website, download the target whatever dot tar. Uh, I have VS Code connected to Mantis, the lab. Again, you're given compiled Linux executables. And only run them on Linux, so you'll need to be on Mantis, Mirage, Windows Subsystem for Linux, something like that. So I'll go ahead and open up uh, the folder where I want to work. See that there's some target stuff from when I was making sure the lab still worked. But I have downloaded target17.tar. I can drag it from my computer into this list of files in VS Code, and it will upload it for me. Then can run tar extract. Show me what files there are. I'll give you the file name, target17.tar. Creates our target17.tar folder. So there are a number of things in here. Uh, there's a readme which says some things about the different files. Uh, the two executables that you are trying to buffer overflow and take control of are ctarget and rtarget. ctarget is for the first three problems, rtarget for the last two. And for each of these phases, ctarget phase one, phase two, phase three, and rtarget phase two and phase three, there are included empty text files that uh, are there for you to kind of put in the input you're going to send to uh, uh, as the input to overflow the buffer, or take control of the program. And finally, there's a uh, there's a cookie.txt. So this is just some random hex value that's specific to your targets that you will need to use in some of the exploits. So the the C target phase one is just call, cause C target to call a particular function. C, the phase two and three are call a particular, particular function with a certain argument. And that argument is your cookie as an integer and then your cookie as a string have to be the arguments to, to the function. So you're both changing 
where this vulnerable function returns to. Because there's some, in each of these targets, there's a, there's a function that uses gets, essentially, to get user input. No checking on the link, so it can overflow the buffer, change return addresses, things like that. So phase one, you just need to call, cause a certain function to be called. See target phase two and three. Uh, you need to cause it to be called with a certain argument. We know that there is a register which is used as the first argument to a function. So uh, you'll need to set that all up. And then our target has the additional security protection of the stack is no longer executable. So for the C target, you're putting some code, code on the stack that then is you're causing it to be executed and take control of the program. Our target stack's not executable. That doesn't work for us. So our target, there's a um, kind of exploit called return-oriented programming, where you just look through the assembly in other parts of the program, and the write-up explains where to look for that. And you just look for sequences of, of bytes that correspond to instructions you happen to want to execute. And these typically won't be actual instructions in the assembly. It's like part of one instruction combined with part of another actually are the instruction we want our exploit to, to execute. So the, these R target ones are basically figuring out how to chain together a bunch of these like bits and pieces of the assembly in another part of the program to still take control of the program, even though the stack isn't executable. Um, the way that the grading is set up, uh, C target phase one and two, 42 points. C target phase three, nine points. R target phase two, four points. R target phase three, two points. So that sort of is kind of the, so the, the R target is sort of extensions beyond kind of the, the main part of the lab. Questions on this so far? I will get to demoing um, how, some things about uh, the input. All right, so let's say that as part of our exploit, we want to write the hex value Forty five B sixty one. It's probably some we want to overwrite the return address with this hex value. But all of our programs are taking string input. So if we literally just type this out as the input forty five B sixty one, it's going to be read as ASCII. So it's going to be read as like a byte that's thirty four, a byte that's thirty, a byte that's thirty five, a byte that's whatever lowercase b is. And so we need to take the byte values that we want to put in and turn them into the ASCII that will give us a byte that's 40, a byte that's 5B, a byte that's 61. There's a program included in the handout to do this for us. So C target phase one, I want there to be a, and we're in little endian, important for this lab. So I want 61 to be first, then 5B, then 40 those three values. And I'm separating them by, uh, uh, separating each byte by, by spaces. And I can also include comments in these files to help me kind of uh, fit, uh, remember kind of what the different pieces are. I recommend using this once you have like 60 byte values in there and you're trying to figure out why it isn't working useful to have comments to separate out these sections so that you can study it more, more closely. But um, I just say, okay, this is, this is my return address. And uh, also important, there needs to be a space between the comment thing and the comment text. Otherwise, this utility that I'm about to show, hex to raw, won't figure out that it's a comment. Um, all right. so. In the terminal, if I just use cat to print out C target, nope, I need to go into target 17. Uh, if I print out C target dot phase one, 
See that? But I want to convert this into like the three ASCII characters that correspond to 61, 5B, and 40. So one way I can do that is to use what's called a pipe in, uh, in uh, the, the terminal or the shell, which is this command, cat ctr phase one is going to like print out the contents of this file. And I can instead take what it would print out and just feed it directly into another command <laughs> using this pipe character. So I'm going to feed it directly into running the hex to raw program. And these commands are all, all up here in Appendix A in the, the write-up, so you can refer to them there. And when I do this, I see that, okay, I get the letter A, open square bracket, at symbol, are going to correspond to the ASCII bytes 61, 5B, and 40, and hex. So this is, this is taken the hex values that I want to appear in memory and turn them into the string, which when the vulnerable program reads in that string and puts it in memory, it will put 61, 5B, and 40 in memory. The last step of this would be to, I can then take what hex to raw is giving out and instead of printing that out, feed it directly into my target. And this says that I didn't actually make anything happen, perhaps because I didn't overflow the buffer with only three characters. Uh, and so it says normal return, there was no exploit. Um, but if I had overflowed the buffer, overwritten a return address, done whatever else I needed to do, it would let me know and send that result to, to the server. Sorry. What would uh, passing a string text raw look like that was going to type stuff? And uh, maybe if you want to type out a string faster than text raw. Um, so you could do uh, hex to raw. Uh, I think you do 61 IB 40. Is that going to work? Um, so you wouldn't normally like type out a, a string. Well, actually, what if I, no. So the other, and there's examples of this in the write-up as well, you can, uh, in, a, in addition to using these pipes to take the output of one command directly into the next, uh, our terminal is going to let us uh, redirect where input or output is going. So for example, I can run hex to raw, and here is just waiting for, for input from, from the terminal. So I do 61, 5B, 40, end of file, which was, is control D, then it printed out this, this string. I could instead use the an arrow to say, okay, instead of getting input from the terminal, get input from this file. I can also redirect, instead of sending the output to display, I'm going to redirect the output to ctarget.phase1.raw. And this has created a new file, ctarget dot phase one dot raw that has the output that this would have printed out. Eric. Could you, could you hypothetically overwrite the input file as the output file? Like if you use target dot phase one and didn't put any output? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, so I, I think in bash this would work. I'm using a slightly different shell that warns me I could use slightly different syntax, syntax to force it to overwrite. But if you haven't done something on Mantis to cause it to use Z shell, I think this would work to overwrite the file. Other questions? How do you know when to put a greater than or less than? So the, the arrow that's kind of going into the command is telling it like where to get input from. And the arrow that's going away from the command is telling it where to send the output to. Okay. Thank you. Etienne. Um, yes, so, so the, the, these arrows are telling it to get input and, or send output to a file. Pipes we use to get input or send output to another command. So in the very first thing I was doing, 
I was running a command that output the contents of the file and then piping that, sending that to X to raw. So you could, there are all, basically, yeah, you could, you could redo this with some combination of pipes and, and input redirection. Other questions? So the other thing, uh, and what, what Eric asked about that we'll need to do uh, for um, uh, some of these phases is to uh, actually have our have in our input assembly code that we're going to hijack the program to have it execute. So we're going to put a, a code on the stack and then change the return address to be the address of that code so that when the function returns, we execute this nefarious code that we've put on the stack. So how do we actually get from assembly to the like bytes that we need to put on the stack? Uh, the first uh, would be, let's hand code some assembly. So .s is the uh, usual extension for assembly. And just for the sake of example, let's add q10 to rx and return. And say this is the assembly that, that I want to, want to have happen. And then this is Appendix B of the write-up, uh, all the stuff I'm doing now. Uh, and you can, we want to use GCC and dash C. Uh, yes? Oh, yeah. I, yes. Typo. Um, I do GCC dash C to tell it, don't try and make a complete program out of this. Take it to that object file, kind of the, the step before we link everything together to an actual executable. So uh, an object file and give it the assembly code. Oh, I need to actually save it. And yes, it did say that raw was a, it's a bad. Um, it's also warning me I didn't have a new line, but it put one in for me. Don't know why that's a warning. Anyway, so I have this example.o, but it's a compiled binary file. And so to actually see what's inside it, I need to decompile it, which we can do with object dump dash D. And I can see, okay, these are the bytes. These four bytes give me add 10 to RAX, and then C3 is for return. And so I would just take 4883. These are already in little ending. They're already in the correct order for what they would be in memory. So I would just take these five bytes as, say, these five bytes would appear somewhere in my, say, ctarget.phase2 as the bytes I want to put on the stack to cause that code, code to be executed. Sam? And so those bytes, as for that command, are when you do this gcc c yeah, so this GCC is, I'm telling the C compiler, which is, I mean, GCC is several different parts of the compiler altogether. Uh, I'm telling it, take this assembly code and turn it into a compiled binary file. Um, and uh, it's called an object file, which is why it's dash O. Uh, and then to see the actual bytes inside that, I need another tool, object dump, is, is the one I'm using here to just spit out here is the assembly uh, taking the bytes that are in the file. It's decoding them into this assembly and also showing me the bytes, which in this case are what I'm I'm interested in. Eric, would let me say like a dot s file because I don't think I have a proper extension or assembly hmm. extension downloaded. Yeah, so it may not give you like. <coughs> Syntax highlighting or show it with like there's a little ASM here, um, but I think it should still let you save it. Uh, we can take a look after class. Other questions? All right, so that's the lab plus a little bit about uh, shell. Uh, with pipes and, and input output redirection. Uh, so let's move on to the main event today, which is uh, starting our discussion of dynamic memory allocations. So when I was first 
talking about malloc and free in C, I said that we later in the term would look into precisely what malloc and free are doing in order to give us memory on the heap and free it up. And that time has come. So uh, a little refresher first. If I have some C code, say a function foo takes an int n, outside this function I declare an array, Four integers. This is going to be as a global variable be put in the static slash globals region of memory. That's one of the places values can live. If I have Declare a local integer or some versions of C let you do dynamically sized arrays. So there's an argument n, and I'm creating a local uh, array of integers that's, uh, that has n integers in it. And this int temp may just be in a register, but if it were in memory, these local variables would be on the stack and be automatically allocated when the fun as the function executes and deallocated by the time it returns. And we can also use malloc. size of int instead of just putting in 4, just to make it slightly more portable in case I'm on some weird system where an int is a different size. And this memory that's allocated by malloc would be on the heap. And uh, as we've talked about, memory on the heap is going to be explicitly managed by programmers in C. We're going to Say malloc for every single piece of memory that we want on the heap and free for every one we want to we want to deallocate. Questions on this bit of C code. Alright, the two questions that we're gonna focus on for uh, the next few classes are physical memory. Are any computer systems going to have a finite amount of physical memory? How can we manage it while also giving programs as much virtual memory as they want? As we've talked about how every program we run in Linux, the stack is at the same address, the code is at the same address, we have these same sections of memory for each, and while if we have three programs running, and they all have stack at the same, the stack is at the same address for all of them. Well, we don't want them actually overwriting each other. And so there's an important distinction between what is going on in physical memory and what this illusion programs are working with is telling. And so we 
need to figure out how can we manage our physical memory while providing this very convenient illusion of virtual memory? That's question one. Question two. Quickly, efficient as in they don't waste a bunch of memory. Question two here is lab four. We will be implementing Malik and Free, and so we're going to start with question two so that we're prepared for the lab and then come back to question one. So, how can we do uh, Malik and Free quickly and efficiently? So, it's worth taking a step back and asking why do we need dynamic memory allocation, period? Right? Why do we need to be able to call malloc to get memory allocated? It is the case that we may have data structures, say a linked list, where we don't know how many nodes are in the linked list to begin with. <coughs> And so if we needed to, uh, if we couldn't do something like memory, we would have to commit ahead of time to how much memory we were going to reserve for nodes in our linked list. Because every other kind of memory allocation we have, whether it's stack or global, whatever it is, we are committing ahead of time to kind of what chunk of memory is going to, is going to be used for that. And that means that we have to hard code a bunch of things. We've got to say, okay, our list can be at most 100 or most 1,000 uh, uh, nodes long. We're just going to reserve that chunk of space at the start. Um, and this might be inefficient. This might be very difficult to maintain if we then need to go back and make this bigger or smaller. Uh, so we want the ability to kind of request memory like right when we need it. And that's where this heap allocation comes in. And the thing that is doing the thing that is doing malloc and free, the kind of component of our system, is called an allocator. Something that's managing allocating and deallocating memory. And there are two general types of allocators. One is an implicit allocator, which automatically detects unused memory. And this is what's happening in Java or Python, for example. That in either of those languages, we create a new object, and when we create it, memory for that allocated on the heap, and uh, the language is keeping track of all the chunks of memory that the program has allocated on the heap, and at some interval, is just going through those chunks and determining are any of these no longer being used. And if they aren't being used anymore, it frees them up. And this is a process that goes by the colorful name garbage collection. So you might hear that like Java is a garbage collected language, or there is a garbage collector that's part of the Java runtime. And it's this piece that's automatically detecting when we're, when we're done with memory. One way that this is done is just by counting how many pointers there are, how many references there are to some chunk of memory. And if that goes down to zero, no one's using it anymore, and it can be deallocated. <coughs> Any thoughts on why 
on, on potential downsides to this implicit allocation. It's slow. Yeah, it's we have to actually like do some work to do this detection. So there's there's some extra overhead, some extra work involved. You might try things to make it more efficient, but yeah, you're gonna pay some cost. Oh. It's probably like not perfect. I mean, the PI algorithm can still be used, but it's not PI algorithm can it's not be used. Yeah, so there may be limits to how close it can get to kind of optimally deallocating things as, as soon as it can. In practice, these garbage collectors will be very conservative. They will never, they will do everything they can to never deallocate something that might be used. Because that's going to crash the program. If they let something sit around for a while, that's a bit of extra memory use, but it's not going to like uh, destroy what's going on. Also, every couple of hours, if I never have to do you know, like a place different? Yeah, so we, there's this sort of trade off as well. How often do we run this garbage collection? We run it all the time, probably going to be quick, or uh, there'll be less memory for it to deallocate, but the more often we run it, the more overhead we're, we're paying. If we run it less often, a bunch of memory, like our memory use increases because we're not freeing stuff when we could. Uh, what is, what, what might you say is uh, the biggest benefit to our implicit allocator? Uh, it's a lot, a lot easier to code. <laughs> yeah, we can't mess it up. <laughs> Java or Python is gonna do this for us and we don't even have to think about, did I free this, can I free this? The language is doing so it's going to protect us from from ourselves make life a lot easier so that brings me to the other kind explicit and this is when we're allocating memory through manual requests i.e. through calls to mal, and deallocating also through manual requests calls to free. And the, our explicit allocator has kind of just the inverse of the advantages and disadvantages of our implicit. It's going to give us really, we, we can have as much control as we want over the memory use of our program which means both we can make it really good and also really screwed up. So there's that double-edged sword there. Questions on this? Thanks. Can you have like smaller programs run even faster by just not bringing anything ever? And just so you know, we're going to have to do any sort of like <laughs> garbage selection. And you're like, yeah, whatever, we're not going to use up all the memory, or we're just going to we just want to start as quickly as possible. Yes, yeah, so the uh, question was could we run small programs faster by never freeing memory? Um, the lab for allocator, there are two ways that we might assess the performance of an allocator. Uh, how many requests it can handle per second, and how much memory it wastes. And there's a trade-off. We could waste, we could never free memory, waste the maximum amount of memory, but then our the number of requests we can handle per second is extremely high because we're doing no work when a request comes in. So yes, we can we can make an allocator super inefficient and, and very fast. Not very useful in practice. Uh, uh, in that, if we have a small program, uh, the, the uh, if it's short running, this this garbage collection kind of won't ever run. Uh, for example, other questions. John, is it possible to like? Like if you were running a, a program that didn't use too much memory to like uniform certain parts of memory is like to be freed later, but not worry about it during the program and do it at some later time so that the program <coughs> would be quicker, or just like that uniform know, process essentially like count as that work that we're doing. So as far as I do not know any of any garbage collected language that 
gives you that fine-grained control. Uh, explicit, you just do that by calling free at the later time. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of something that's like some sort of hybrid between these two, though I would, uh, I, I would assume it exists in some form. All right, so what are we, what are we actually talking about in terms of uh, mapping? So here, <coughs> Malik is going to return a pointer to the start of some block of memory on the heap that's at least as big as the number of bytes that we asked for. A couple of properties of this. As we've talked about, it's uninitialized. Whatever is, is in those bytes is whatever was there before. However, There's a, another function that's part of the same package, calloc or calloc, that will zero initialize, that will write zeros to all the bytes in the chunk of memory. It's giving you a pointer to. So if you, I mean, it's, it's extra work for it to go through and write zeros to all those bytes. Uh, so malloc will be somewhat faster. Uh, but if we need something zero initialized, there is uh, an allocation function that, that gives us that, that gives that to us, and and on a sixty-four bit x eighty six system, these blocks that we're getting pointers to will be sixteen byte aligned, which means their address will be a multiple of sixteen. And this helps any data that we put inside that block also to be aligned. Underneath, malloc is This operating system function s break s b r k in order to control the heap size, and this s break takes in an increment that it will use to change change the heap size. So just like we had, uh, we have our stack, and we have our stack pointer, our RSP register that's telling us where the boundary of the stack is, and we move that to change the size of the stack, get more memory on the stack, deallocate it. Our heap. There's a special operating system variable. It's not a register. BRK, the break, which tells us where the top of the heap is. And since the heap is growing this way, that is growing this way, this break is the boundary of the heap. So that's where this S break function comes in. It is just taking the increment, whether it's positive or negative, adding it to break, to change where the boundary of the heap is, and just like moving the stack pointer, changing this boundary can either add more memory to the heap or take memory off the heap. Which puts your breaks to some pointer memory on the register. That's right, it's not, RSP has its own dedicated register, break is just a value the operating system maintains in memory somewhere. 
but it's vir it's in like the virtual memory system, right? Yes. So this picture that I I have drawn a number of times has always been virtual memory. It's always the picture of memory from the program's perspective. And we'll see uh, in a few classes how that relates to the picture of memory from the operating system's perspective. Um, so indeed, this, this break is maintained for each separate program, because each program has its own heap. Have you noticed, I like the um, so just like both the heap and the stack, their kind of uh, non-moving boundary is just initialized to some spot in memory when the program starts. Um, so there. Yeah, so there, there may or, or may not be uh, a gap. Um, uh, I think the heap kind of lives at middle addresses, the codes at low addresses, the stacks at high addresses. Uh, and so whether there's a gap or not would depend on how much stuff uh, there is. Um, but uh, the, the important thing for our purposes is that only one boundary of the heap moves, only one boundary of the stack moves, and the other is, is fixed. Other questions? So, we have malloc or calloc to get, uh, to, to allocate a chunk of memory on the heap, get back a pointer to it, uh, and then we have free is going to take a pointer and it has to be a, a pointer that exactly was returned by malloc or calloc previously. And if we <coughs> pass free any other argument than a pointer that was previously returned by malloc or calloc, its behavior is undefined, usually with no error, possibly with no problem, or maybe big problems. But free specifically takes a pointer to s that we previously got back from malloc, some chunk that was that was already allocated, and then marks it as available for future allocations. So, I want to help give a sense of how these functions are working. I want to uh, do a demo in a spreadsheet here, and so each of these cells outlined in black is an eight byte word, so an eight byte chunk on the heap. And so our entire heap is these cells, column B to column S. And so we have a call to malloc come in, malloc 32, and our allocator says, sure, I can give you 32, and then return you a pointer to the start of that chunk. And so now P1 is whatever the address of this first cell is. So we have... <coughs> That is the state of our heap. And now we have another request come in. Malloc of 40. We can say, yep, we have a chunk of 40 for you right here. Here's our pointer P2. And return that pointer to, uh, to the user. However, we need to keep these chunks 16 byte aligned. So things uh, to, um, to, to have alignment play well. So because we allocated a chunk of 40, 40 is not a multiple of 16, so we're going to round it up to the nearest multiple of 16 to satisfy alignment and add 8 bytes of internal fragmentation. So this, these 8 bytes are kind of 
part of fulfilling this request for 40 bytes. And we sort of put eight bytes of, we add eight bytes extra onto this request to keep everything uh, 16 byte aligned. All right, so that's the state when we have uh, another request come in, this time for 48. We have room for that. Allocate those 48 bytes. Return the pointer to the start of that block. Eric? Um, do you mean 16 bit aligned? Because. Uh, I mean 16 byte uh, aligned. Um, so, like, each of these squares represents 8 bytes. 8 bytes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and kind of in. When we're talking about memory addresses, a particular memory address refers to a particular byte. So memory addresses will always be like byte aligned in, in some way. They, they, they won't refer to individual bits. Uh, other questions? All right, so we have our free of P2. So this is a pointer that was previously returned by malloc. So our allocator says, great, we will free that up. It's available for future requests. Uh, continuing on, we then have P4, malloc equals malloc of 16. So now uh, users looking for a chunk of 16 bytes. Our allocator looks through the heap and says, great, we have 16 bytes right here. That's 16 byte aligned. Here's P4. Then we have our last request here, P5 equals malloc of 48. And we have a problem. We have 32, a chunk of 32 free bytes here and a chunk of 16 free bytes here. We have no chunk of 48 free bytes. So even though we have a total amount of free space on our heap that equals 48. We have enough free space that if it were all in one chunk, we would be able to meet this request. But because it's split up, because it's fragmented, we can't fulfill this request and we'd have to, say, use sbreak to increase the size of our heap so that there is somewhere a chunk of 48 bytes. And this is what is called external fragmentation. The idea that we had enough total space for the request, but because of the arrangement of our allocated blocks, we're not able to fulfill the request. Silas. Wait, so where is, where is breakpoint to do all this? Uh, so it would be the kind of <coughs> boundary of the heap. It would be the, the, the top of our heap in this picture, which would be uh, uh, here. So our break, uh, our break would be here, and then Calling, calling S break with a positive increment could move it, move it up and give us more, more of these blocks on the heap. Christian. So does our malloc allocator always find the first available block in memory to use? Because if, if we malloc P4 to be that last 16 bytes of memory, then we could have avoided that. Yes, that's a great point, that it mattered where I chose to place the request. And the placement strategy, how the allocator chooses to place requests, is part of the design of the allocator, and different allocators might make different decisions. And the way it makes decisions is what is called placement policy. And uh, on, on Monday, I'll go into detail on different placement policies and other sorts of design decisions we have to think about when, when implementing an allocator. Can you explain again how in the that becomes an external fragmentation? So we have a situation where we need to allocate 48 bytes. And if I add up all the blank cells in my heap, there are six total blank cells. That sums up to 48 bytes. So I have enough free space total that it could meet the request. But when I allocate memory on the heap, I'm giving back a pointer to the start of a chunk of memory that has to be as big as what they requested. So there's no pointer I could give back to somewhere on this heap that would be the start of an available chunk of 48. 
So it means that I, can, given just this amount of memory and where the allocated blocks are, I can't allocate a chunk of 48 bytes. I can't meet this request. And so external fragmentation, I should write this down. The two kinds of, of fragmentation I've mentioned The first was internal fragmentation, which was uh, which, as the name internal suggests, is padding wasted space, often from rounding something up to a multiple of 16 that is inside. Uh, it could also be the cause uh, a source of heap. Uh, if there is extra information in the heap, uh, the allocator needs to keep track of. Uh, what I what I'm trying to say is. Any memory that is not part of the payload, meaning the part of the heap that the person who called malloc is actually using. The person who called malloc asked for, in, in our P2, asked for 40 bytes. And so we gave them a chunk of 40 bytes, but then there was some extra memory that we included in that block on the heap that is not part of the, the payload, is not part of the, the memory that the, uh, the caller is actually using. And so that is, that is internal fragmentation. Our external fragmentation. Um, so, uh, we want to put the start of our block and the pointer that we give back to the user kind of right after the end of some previous block because that's what is ensuring our 16 byte alignment. That if all the previous blocks were a multiple size of a multiple of 16, the next thing right after all of those also a multiple of 16. So we know that, that this address here should be a multiple of 16. If we instead put the padding here and gave them the address here, it might be out of alignment. So that's why, that's why we put it at the end. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah. Ellie? Why do we care about 16? Isn't the biggest size of the object eight, like pointers and doubles and stuff? Uh, so, when we get to, when we're in a 64-bit uh, system, um, uh, C++, for example, uh, I think you would do like a long, long, like there are, there are, beyond the sort of basic types that we've talked about, we can end up with stuff that's bigger than, than 8 bytes. So, um, there is some, there, for that reason, there's some potential benefit to, to having things be 16 byte aligned. Does it mean like malloc 1 or malloc 16 are basically the same? Like they use the same amount of memory. So like when we're thinking about like saving memory, we should only think about it if it lowers it to like multiple 16. Yes. The, the, the consequence of this 16 byte alignment is asking the allocator for one byte, it's still going to have to give you 16 in order to maintain 16 byte alignment. Um, so yes, all requests below 16 they're just going to be rounded up to 16. John? We have a structure that like has multiple, like smaller than 16 bytes reserved for each of its like sub units. 
but its overall size is 16 bytes. Does that like, maintain the 16 byte alignment? So the 16 byte alignment is applying to the memory addresses that malloc returns. It should be multiples of 16. So that the user can put whatever they want inside of them, and assuming that the struct or whatever that they put inside of them is following its internal alignment, the whole thing will be aligned. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, getting back to external fragmentation, uh, this is. contiguous block of free memory that is big enough to satisfy uh, the current request. So malloc 489 will do with your external fragmentation because you don't have malloc 489. Um, yes, so, so in if P5 was malloc 49 or malloc 64 or malloc 128, uh, in all of those cases, no matter how we had, how, no matter what our previous decisions about where to place blocks were, we were never going to be able to meet that request without adding more memory to the heap because there simply was not enough total space. So, how do you that? so that would not be an example of fragmentation because it's, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with how we arranged the, the blocks within the heap. Uh, and so, yes, in that case, uh, even if we had uh, uh, made a different decision and put P4 at the end here, any request comes in bigger than, uh, than these 48, 48 bytes, we wouldn't be able to meet it regardless. And so it's not caused by fragmentation. We just are using too much memory only. Sam? Um, sort of off of that, like, it's always the easy in this example to be like, oh, put P4 at the end. Is that something that you're able to do? Or is that something that, like, this is always the way it happens? There's no way you can sort of work around it. Uh, so, one way we could decide about where to put things is we want to find a available chunk of memory that is the best fit, or like a, a perfect fit for the amount of memory that's being requested. So we could have, instead of just stopping as soon as we found a free chunk that was big enough, we could have looked through the whole heap until we found one that was just the right size. So that, that's a different sort of placement policy that we could have. Um, but it means that filling the request is slower because we're always like looking for, for something that fits best. All right, so. I'd like to leave you with uh, a bit of practice. We won't bother with the cards since we just have a few a few minutes. Um, and uh, take a minute to consider which of these would not be a source of internal fragmentation. <laughs> yes, the the. Pattern of future requests is like how much memory is going to be requested in future calls to Malik. Yeah, so in this case, it would be this pattern of future requests is not a source of internal fragmentation. Internal fragmentation is this all this stuff that could be added on as parts of parts of a block on the heap. John, future request interaction poorly replacement policy. Right, yeah, well, so that's not about what's internal to the block, though. So that's not internal fragmentation. So what is D referring to here? Like, I'm, I'm not really sure I think, like, in memory, you're saying, like, 
Yes. D is referring to the exciting topic for Monday's lecture. So I'll, I'll leave you with that cliffhanger. Uh, keep, keep working on, on uh, lab three. Uh, have a good weekend, and I'll see you Monday. Thanks, Aaron.